Good morning. It's good to see you here. Um, I want to just extend a welcome to each one of you, whether you're here with us or whether you're watching online. Um, welcome to um, the community church, and uh, we welcome God's presence here as well. Um, before we get started, we're just going to go through a little bit of business and have a couple of announcements. So I'm going to invite Damaris and um, Amber <laughs> up. I have one really important announcement. Sorry. Um, last, as of last Friday, there have been some issues in the upstairs washroom in the nursery. So that washroom is not usable at all. You can't run the taps in there. You can't use the toilet. Um, the, our management team is working diligently to um, find some solutions to the problem. If you do have questions about it, you can talk to Liz or Ryan, um, very capable people who are working on some solutions. Um, so yeah, Amber and uh, Damaris, would you please come up? Good morning. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit more about VBS later, uh, but the announcement that I have this morning is we gave a handful of our supplies to another church in the city who is going to be able to make use of those supplies, and we gave some of that we handed some of that off to them on Friday, which was really exciting. And then they said they would actually take the rest of it, which is even more exciting because it, they're such cool props, the telescopes and the rocket and the astronaut and everything else that we have, but they are unable to get it to the city. So I just want to put the word out there. If anyone has ideally an enclosed trailer that we could borrow or we could pull together a few trucks uh, and haul things in for them and, and they'll be making a donation from what I understand for some of those supplies and the hard work we've put in but we would love to bless them with that and so if you ha if you know of uh, a trailer or some trucks come talk to me and we can work on getting that to the city thanks Morning, just a few things from me today. Um, just tagging on to another thing for VBS. Thank you so much for everybody who donated things, who lent things for the decorations, who showed up to help put everything up. I think it turned out really well. Thank you so much for that, and as well for people who took down stuff. It was very efficient. I didn't actually help with the takedown because it happened before I even got here. So um, thank you so much for those who put in time and energy to make that happen. And the faces on the kids who came here were really just uh, excited to see the things we had put together. We had transformed this space for them. So that was really awesome. Um, on another note, just a reminder about the library. There's always new books coming in there. Um, one of the sets that Damaris actually recommended is for, from the Orange Curriculum, um, which talks about parenting your child. We have books all the way from your new baby all the way to grade 12. Um, there's a few highlighted in the foyer on that little shelf. Um, so I have four out there, but there's a bunch more in the library itself, and you'll find whatever age your child is up to grade 12 that just talks about um, questions to ask them, discussions to have with them, games to play with them, things like that. So please go help yourself um, and yeah, find something that you're looking for in there. If you have questions about that, let me know or Connie know. Um, and also always find the app. Um, oh, you've got nothing up there right now, but go through the app, find reviews, find new books that we have brought in there, and uh, just let me know if you have something that you want to bring in. Tap Connie on the shoulder as well. My third and final announcement is just for the church cleaning day. You might have noticed on the Friday email, there's a date change. So now we have it on April 27th, Saturday, April 27th, from 9 a.m. to noon. Come on out. There'll be some refreshments provided, and there'll be some work to do. As always, we want to get our hands dirty and just make sure this church looks nice and fresh after the winter. We'll wash some windows. Um, we'll we have a goal to clean the light fixtures, so if anybody's really good on a really tall ladder, then come on out, um, and we'll have a great time. Thank you. We want to do some baptism and membership classes coming up, and if you are interested in that, just to meet uh, after church, we'll just have a short meeting just to try and figure out a date to get together and, and begin those. So. Uh, just come and see me right after church. Thank you.
Wingman on Tuesday, seven o'clock, we're gonna go again, okay? So that's at Trinity Safety. And uh, I want you to bring your best getting stuck story. And if you have a picture, that's even better, okay? So, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, getting stuck and, and who helps us out and, uh, in those times. But bring, if you've got pictures, that would be great. Um, I'll tell you quickly a little embarrassing story, not, not as embarrassing anymore, but Gwen and myself. I'm going to tell them that story. Everybody has one of these stories. I think you do. We do. We got lots of them. But uh, when we were dating, <clears throat> we might have been out a little late at night, and it was dark. And it was down, it's not Strawberry Lane, it was a railroad drive in Hepburn. Anyways, our lights weren't the best, and uh, it was springtime. And uh, so we we're the two of us, it was probably midnight, we were out too late. And we were dating, and uh, so we came up on a puddle, and we thought, ah, oh, we could easily get through this. So we kept driving and driving. We drove till we could, we were into at least a foot of water, and we got stuck. Okay, deep. Can, I, can, I, can I edit? So there was a puddle on the road, and Wendell thought, I bet we can go around this. And he took to the field to go around it. No, That's actually, you, no, you can't change the story. You got to let me tell. The best part is we had to get towed out. We got back and told, and my dad and mom were there, and, and dad was just going to kind of give me the gears. And then mom piped up, hey, Reuben, remember when that happened to us? <laughs> and then we all had a good laugh. So anyways, guys. Uh, bring your best getting stuck story and pictures, and we're going to have a time, obviously, of prayer together. But uh, you know what? If you haven't been at Wingmen for a while, uh, come on out, guys. It's really important for us as men to, uh, to build each other up, to share stories, to be real. And to be real, guys, means uh, it's a safe place to talk, okay? We want, we want to care for each other. And uh, so that's Tuesday. 7 o'clock at, at Trinity Safety. All right? Thank you. And if you leave your wives at home, you can tell the story however you want to tell it. <laughs> always got to have the last word. <laughs> Wendell said she always has to have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got the last word, right? <laughs> and turn my mic off. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Adam. <laughs> All right, lots, lots to um, keep in our memories for this week. Um, Tony's going to come up and lead us in communion, but as, before we do that, would you bow with me? Actually, let's stand. And would you bow with me in prayer? Father, I thank you for being present in this world, in our lives. Um, <clears throat> thank you that you want the very best for us. And we invite your presence here this morning. And we welcome you here, Father. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would um, just guide us, our thoughts, um, lead us to the places where you want us to be. And uh, we want to follow you willingly. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the next little while, we're going to be, for communion, we're going to be going through different meals that Jesus was participating in. And so, John 2. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding as well. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. <laughs> she got the last word in. <laughs> Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. He told them, now draw out some and take it to the master of the banquet. They did, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone, who brings, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. 
but you've saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. As we gather at the table, um, we see in this story the, the dashed circle of the kingdom of God where it's not just this closed circle where uh, we're out of the wine and no more can come. But Jesus enters into our space and is able to bring things and, and the kingdom of God is bigger than what we can see and what we can, uh, um, the restrictions and the things that we have in front of us. And so as we gather today, we sit uh, with Jesus as he turned water into wine.
later in John, he summarizes his gospel by saying, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I just thought I should say, last night we had the pleasure of meeting Melissa. <laughs> and uh, we have loved giving showers here for the gals that are either marrying somebody or, oh, sorry, I butted into offering. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, we've just loved giving showers for the girls. And uh, last night was just so refreshing to celebrate Melissa and Zach's upcoming marriage, and uh, I think he's not going to be <laughs> bored at all. <laughs> so we just had a lot of fun. On <laughs> Heather, let's let's do the offering. Lord, I thank you for what you've given to us, and as we return some back to you, we um, we ask that you're bless you would bless it, please, in your name, Amen. So let's stand and sing He Lives.
I picked a psalm for today, Psalm 121. And uh, it's awesome to sing worship. I know some of us aren't in where we should be with our worship, and some of us are really struggling to those that we know and those that we don't know. And this first, this psalm came to me yesterday. God, the help of those who seek him. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore.
Do you want to go back down to your spot? Morning, everyone. Okay. Um, funerals are not fun, but they do have a way of putting things into perspective. I was at my grandma's funeral on Tuesday afternoon, and, um, you know, in a lot of ways, she lived a pretty ordinary life. But when I was listening to different people uh, talk about her life, it's pretty extraordinary the effect that you can have on your community just by living your life and having the fruits of the Spirit um, demonstrated in living your life every day. You know, she always had time for people, and um, it was genuine. She really cared about how you were doing and what you were up to and, and what was going on in your life. And, um, and she always was compassionate, and, and she was always had really good sound advice to give, um, really well thought out. And, and so thinking about her life um, and thinking about maybe how I want to live my life a little bit made me think of a, a passage out of Colossians chapter 3, um, starting in verse 12. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thanks, Darren. Um, Gwen, thanks for leading in that song, um, the one we just sang. What's the title? Or Heather, sorry. No, no, Holy Forever. Um, this morning, actually over the last couple of days, I've just been thinking about <clears throat> things that are happening in our lives, in this church or in people, the lives of people we know. <clears throat> and things can get incredibly overwhelming. Um, and I find myself, when I have concerns about my family or friends that I have, I can focus so much on a situation, and it is overwhelming, and I forget to focus on the, the one who can solve my problems. Um, this morning I was out for a walk, and I had a song running through my head. It's, um, I actually learned it in Spanish, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak the Spanish words, but first I'll say it in English. It's called Forever Yahweh. Um, and it just focuses on God. Adonai, Elohim, the great I am, lives in me. El Shaddai, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, here with me. Your name is great and greatly to be praised. Your name is great and greatly to be praised. Um, and then, worthy you are, or worthy you were, worthy you are, worthy you will be, forever Yahweh. In Spanish, for those of us who speak Spanish. <laughs> Adonai, Elohim, el gran yo soy, vive en mí. El Shaddai, príncipe de paz, Emmanuel, conmigo está. Tu nombre es grande y digno de alabanza. Uh, and then, let's see, where is it? Digno eres tú, digno eres tú, digno serás para siempre, Yahweh. Forever, Yahweh. As we uh, walk through stuff in Kingdom of God, one of the things that, that I've come to realize is that uh, there, there are examples as we walk through Scripture as contrasting and comparing the Kingdom of God and the Kingdom of Earth and how they are different. One of the significant uh, differences that are shown in the use of animals, uh, animal metaphors. And today we're gonna be looking at a wolf 
and in a couple of weeks be looking at a lamb. Uh, a couple months ago during our question and answer time, Wendell had asked about uh, false prophets, and uh, I pointed to Matthew 7 and how they were described as wolves. Um, as we continue to, to look at what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and actually the opposite this morning, um, there are parts of today that are going to be unpleasant. Uh, and for some of you, uh, the things I'm going to talk about today are, are, uh, will bring back memories and things that you would rather probably not. And so I, I don't do this lightly. Uh, and yet, um, feel it is important to walk through. The opposite of a follower of Jesus is a wolf. And it's, there's only like 10 or 12 wolf references in Scripture, but one of the fascinating things is that every wolf reference has an adjective that's linked with it. And so we're going to walk through some of those adjectives today. Uh, they're called ferocious, savage, uh, they devour, they divide, they ravage, they tear, they shed blood. Uh, so we're going to start in Matthew 7 with a passage about false prophets and then cruise through some other wolf passages. Um, as we walk through this, the idea of the wolf gives us an idea of what uh, the follower of Jesus is not. And you might wonder why we're actually talking about this in church. Uh, Churches should be safe from wolves, shouldn't they? In Matthew 7, the wolves are within the body. In Acts 20, which we're going to look at in a few minutes, the wolves are within the body. In Genesis 49, as it talks about wolves, it describes Benjamin, one of the tribes of Israel, as a wolf. In Ezekiel 22, the wolves are the princes, the leaders of Israel. And same in Zephaniah 3. In fact, half of the wolf references are from wolves from that come from within. And so, uh, unfortunately, uh, I have to talk about it. Because they as much come from inside as they do from outside. Um, so Matthew 7, 15 to 20 is uh, where we're going to go first. Uh, so Matthew seven fifteen, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, will you recognize them. The first adjective of a wolf is that they are ferocious this word ferocious has a few uh, layers to it. Uh, one of them is actually rape and sexual abuse. What God had created and intended for good, wolves destroy. What was intended to be for life, uh, Wolves bring destruction and mistrust and shame, confusion, anger, and death. I'm going to leave that one there this morning, but it just it's one of the layers. Another layer of the word ferocious is that uh, their appetite for taking from other people is ravenous. They just take and take and take and take, and nothing fills them. Uh, they do not respect the boundaries of others, and this is where that sexual abuse part fits in. Uh, they crush others and take what they want. They extort from others. Extort from others, I mean. It's like the, uh, the mafia guy who goes to the business owner and says, hate for there to be a fire here. 
pay me some money and we'll ensure that that doesn't happen. Extortionists demand what another has. They don't have to work for it. They don't have to put the time in. They just steal and take and take and take. Am I respecting then another's boundaries? Another's space. If I'm not, then I am a wolf. Our next one is found in John 10. John 10, verse 12. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. From this one we see that wolves attack. They use their power to overcome your defenses And they plunder you for your own usage. The victims who they are attacking are taken away from their places of safety and comfort, their places where they belong, their homes. And they're taken to places where they're powerless when you have nothing. Think of a refugee being chased from their home when they're left with nothing. In light of their attacking nature, those who are not taken hostage in the space um, are scattered to where they have nothing. When Jesus talks about going after the one sheep, especially in Matthew 18, when Jesus talks about leaving the 99 and going after the one, it's because the one has been scattered by the people who are from within the body, the wolves. Ezekiel 34 goes into this in more detail. Jesus is pursuing the sheep that the leaders of the church have chased away. Think about that for a moment. Um, If I am making another person powerless, I'm a wolf. Acts 20 has a couple of them. Again, I I wish I didn't have to do this, but, and please don't, yeah, I just wish I didn't have to. Uh, Acts 20. Um. Verse 17 sets the, sets the stage, and then 29 and 30. So in 17, for Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. And so they have a conversation. And in 29, as, as Paul is talking to the, to the elders of the church, he tells them this. I know after I leave, savage wolves, you catch the adjective there, not just wolves. Savage wolves will come among you and will not spare the flock Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So in Acts 20, they're called savages. Savage here means to oppress and hard, uh, to oppress and, and cause life to be hard to bear. We've looked at Matthew 11, 28 to 30 quite often, and the image of that is where Uh, Jesus brings this yoke and he puts it on our shoulders not to weigh us down but actually to carry, help carry our burdens with us. And he says, I will help carry your burden. The wolf is the opposite. The wolf says, I'm going to actually put my oppression and my burdens on you so that yours is heavier. Reminded of a, a story in, in 1 Kings uh, 12. And this is the son of uh, Solomon. And the movement from David to Solomon to, to Rehoboam in, in 1 Kings 12 is, is pretty radical. Um, so as Rehoboam is beginning his reign, um, this happens. He says, so they went for... 
went for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Verse 10. So in, in between here, he gets some advice from Solomon's uh, advisors, and they say, yeah, that's probably a pretty good idea. Lighten the load. Verse 10. The young men who had grown up with Rehoboam replied, these, these people say to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke, I'll make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips, I will scourge you with scorpions. Wolves make life more oppressive and heavy. Do I help carry the burdens of others? And this is not what we did a little bit in sharing time and just sharing our burden. This is, this is literally, you need to carry my load. Not in a helpful, we're in this together way, but I'm actually lazy. I can do it myself. But I want to destroy you. So you're going to carry my load. If that is the way things are done, then you're being a wolf. Acts 20 also says they distort. It means they take something good and they pervert it into something that is uh, evil and death. They corrupt the good. We see this in the parasitic nature of evil. Evil cannot create. It cannot build. All it can do is suck the life out of another living thing. They pervert it and take, make something wicked out of it. The Pharisees, we see them acting like wolves around the Sabbath. You see, God created the Sabbath for us to bring, to bring life. It was a day of rest and worship because six days of work and then a day to recover. And so Jesus saw someone who was uh, not well that day and he decided to heal him which is consistent with the Sabbath and consistent with what God intended. But the Pharisees instead saw what Jesus was doing and wanted to kill him. They were wolves. Do I help create and sustain life? Or am I sucking the life out of things? If so, then I'm a wolf. Genesis and Ezekiel have a couple that are related. So Genesis 49 has a story of um, Jacob is blessing his sons, and, and, and this is part of one of them, uh, Genesis 49, 27. Uh, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he devours the prey, and in the evening he divides the plunder. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail. Ezekiel 22 has a similar theme to it. Ezekiel 22, 27. Her officials within her are like wolves tearing their prey. They shed blood and kill people to make unjust gain. Oh, next one. These two passages use the word ravenous. Brent briefly mentioned it before. It's really to tear the flesh of another like a wild beast. It is an anger that cannot be quenched and rage that just continues to tear and destroy, rather than enriching or healing. It is ruining and killing. Are we healing and bringing things together? At the end of the day, is the group of people that we are part of more healthy than when we were there before, when it was there before. What impact do we have? 
If people and relationships are being torn apart, we're being a wolf. Genesis 49 uses the term devour. The image here is similar to locusts completely cleaning off a field. I remember in my late, my late teens, we were in the midst of a drought, and, and the, there were so many grasshoppers, the field was just shimmering as, they, as it moved. Totally cleaned off every living plant on that field. Wolves here devour for itself what belongs to another and what is intended for another. It's like a fire that devours a home, leaving it bereft of life. Those under the oversight of a wolf are left with nothing, while the wolf grows rich and wealthy. Do I seek the flourishing of self, or do I seek the flourishing of other? <coughs> Jeremiah 5, 6 is the next one. Therefore, a lion from the forest will attack them. A wolf from the desert will ravage them. A leopard will lie in wait near their towns to tear to pieces any who venture out. Jeremiah 5 uses the word ravage to describe a wolf. It's to violently ruin and devastate those who are weaker and suffering. I think of what the Russians are doing to the Ukrainian cities in the eastern part of Ukraine. The destruction of a dam, blowing it up for no other reason, just to cause the people who are suffering more suffering. I think it was Kharkiv about a week or so ago. uh, They destroyed all the power within the city. Militarily, it really didn't do much. It's just to destroy the people. Those who take advantage of the, of the others who are weaker and oppressed and leave them with nothing are wolves. When I was on my sabbatical, I was uh, looking closely at the, the story of Cinderella, actually. Uh, there's actually. There's actually a book on the psychology of Cinderella in the story and the envy of the sisters who couldn't handle Cinderella and who she was. Wolves see the weak and they want to leave them with nothing. Do I protect the powerless and the, and the oppressed? Think of Matthew twelve twenty that Jesus does not break a bruised reed or smother a smoldering wick. If I'm getting richer in the backs of the weak or destroying them, because I'm envious of what they have, I'm a wolf. The last one is references to the passage we looked at in Ezekiel 22. It sheds blood. This is, this is probably one of, the, one of the more disturbing ones in this because it, it actually goes for the lifeblood of the animal, like the organs, and what brings them life and targets those especially by destroying the other. When another person has gifts and abilities and we don't give them an opportunity to do that, but instead we, we uh, use control and other things to refuse to let them use that, that's being a wolf actually. It's taking their lifeblood and not allowing it to flow. It's killing them. Wolves target what brings you life, and they seek to destroy it. Come to love the word agency. The word agency means not just giving a person freedom, but to give them the resources to be able to do what they have been made to do. Um, So if I'm killing and starving your gifts, I'm being a wolf. As I started today, uh, we have to look at wolves because they come from within the camp. I hated to do this. I didn't like that. Uh, Over the winter, we created a a spiritual abuse policy to identify wolves and the process of how we would deal with them. I'm not going to go through it today. It's going to be part of uh, my report that will come out at the end of April. 
Uh, unfortunately, wolves arise from within. They have to be identified and dealt with. Wolfish behavior is not acceptable. Um, thankfully, we have a lamb and a lion, Glenn. But we'll look at the lamb in a couple weeks. And the lamb is very different than the wolf. Actually, I want to show this one. It does show a contrast. The wolves take by force what doesn't belong to them. The lamb respects another's boundaries and gives freedom. Wolves remove people from safety to a place where they're powerless. The lamb empowers. It's what the Holy Spirit was. Jesus left so we could have the Holy Spirit to empower us. They're savage. Wolves are. They increase your burdens and make life oppressive and heavy. The lamb carries the burdens of others. Wolves distort by perverting the good into something evil and destroying it. The lamb creates and sustains life. Wolves are ravenous. Their rage causes them to tear things to pieces. The lamb heals. Wolves devour, consuming for themselves what belongs to others. The lamb seeks the flourishing of other. Wolves ravage, ruin, and devastating those who are weaker. The lamb protects the oppressed and the powerless. The wolves shed blood, killing the lifeblood that brings another life. The wolf gives agency to the gifts of others. Um, the kingdom of God is about being a lamb, not a wolf. And uh, yeah, I'm going to just close there. Let's pray. You're so creative, Lord, in the way you gave us your word, your use of uh, metaphors, your spirit that runs through all of scripture that is connected, and it's hard to imagine that uh, this was not given the oversight of the Holy Spirit to see as you do this from Genesis through on to the New Testament. Lord, I pray that you would transform our wolfish tendencies into lambs to resist the temptation to be wolves, to fight it. Lord, I pray for those who are wounded. Who are hurt by wolves. I pray that this This place would be unsafe for wolves. And a place of safety for those who have been wounded by them. Give us patience and love, kindness, generosity, and gentleness. for the smoldering wicks and the bruised reeds among us. Amen. Come on up. Stand and sing with us. I do.
Jesus was sending out the twelve, he told them this, uh, I'm sending you like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time you'll be given what to say. It will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your Father speaking through you. Um, let's leave it at that. The Holy Spirit is with us, and thankfully, at the table, we have one who is a lamb and a lion who is with us. Have a good week.